Good morning, everybody. Um, we're going to get started right now. Um, I just want to say we're a small group. So um, if you have a question or comment during the presentation, please feel free to unmute yourself um, and ask, or you can write it in the chat as well. Um, currently, Jane Megan is here with me monitoring the chat, but I think she is going to be leaving me in a little bit. So um, it's tough for me to go back and forth. So if you could unmute yourself, that would be great. And then we will get started now. Okay. I'm back. I lost everybody and then I got everybody back. So perfect. All right, welcome. So this is Advocacy 101. Um, what I'll be doing today is just kind of running through the main components of what advocacy work looks like, what we do here at Feed More Western New York, and just some quick ways for you to be able to get involved. We'll start right away. Um, technology, it's everyone's best friends. Um, I am Lauren Cohn. I'm the Government Affairs Manager at Feed More Western New York. I came from the food bank side of the merger. Um, I was with the food bank for about four years, so I've been with the whole organization um, for five years. Government affairs has been work that I've been doing for um, probably the past three years. Um, and it's something that I really love, it's something I'm really passionate about, and I am always looking for ways to get our member agencies involved and, you know, and take a little step further. So what is advocacy? Advocacy is just the simple act of pleading or arguing in favor of something such as a cause, idea, or a policy. And then there's advocacy, then there's advocate, was one person who pleads for another's cause. All of you are already advocates, no matter whether or not you think that you're advocates for the individuals that you serve every day in your pantries or your um, soup kitchens or wherever you may be, you're advocates for yourself at your jobs, you're advocates for yourself in life. So just remember that you're already a step ahead of where you thought you were. So advocacy is the active support of an idea or a cause. Um, it encompasses the actions that we take to affect change, usually aimed towards influencing policy, practice, or attitudes. Um, it can take many different forms, but they always involve some type of action, whether that's educating policymakers and the general public, participating in different lobby days or group efforts, contacting your legislators or policymakers, or encouraging others to get involved. That's a big one for us, and that's going to be a big one for you guys to start your advocacy work. But there's a couple of roadblocks that come into play. Um, reasons people are not doing advocacy work, because they just don't understand it. So um, current things that are stopping people from advocacy is their lack of comfort of the advocacy process, um, the lack of knowledge on your issue, lack of time, which I know all of us don't have that problem. We have all the time in the world. Um, lack of focus, um, having the idea that it will not make a difference, and you think that you're not illegally allowed to do this. Um, there is some regulations with 501c3s with advocacy work, so you do have to be careful of what you do, and we'll get into that a little further. Mm. So lobbying is a word that you probably hear a lot in the news. Um, so what is the difference between advocacy and lobbying and what that looks like? So all lobbying is advocacy, but it's not, not all advocacy is lobbying. Um, for 501c3s, lobbying is limited by the IRS's rules and regulations. So, but there's no federal limit on how much non-lobbying advocacy your organiz organization can do. Non-lobbying advocacy is um, advocacy that just involves educating public officials without asking for anything. So if you have someone come to your agency and you give them um, a tour and talk to them about what the work you do in the community and what you see um, in your community and how, how they could help you, well, no, just um, educating them in general, that is a non-lobbying advocacy. That is the majority of the work that we do at Feed More Western New York is education. We, um, I take every day, I try to reach out to elected officials to let them know what we are doing, what our agencies are doing, and how it is impacting their community. So some examples um, are providing statistics on meals served by your program last year compared to this year. 
meeting with your legislators' offices to discuss your program, its missions, and the services you provide, or hosting a legislator to tour your program. Um, I'm using the term legislator here, but that can be, you know, anyone from your town mayor to your town supervisor. And there's no IRS limitations on this. But there's uh, public policy, oops, sorry, sorry, everybody. There's public policy direct lobbying. So that means contacting any legislative member, staff, or government employee to influence him and her to, to propose, support, or oppose specific legislation. This is the second tier of the things that we do here at Feed More Western New York. Um, when there is a bill that's coming up, whether it's federally or at the state level, and we have an opinion on it, we will make that known. We will reach out to our contacts at either the state office or the federal office to let them know where we, um, where we stand and what we think would impact the individuals we serve a little more. Just examples of this, on the federal level, it's emailing a member of Congress to support the farm bill that would increase his funding for SNAP or TFAP. At uh, the state level, if a budget introduces cuts to HIPNAP funding, um, speaking out against that funding to your state senator, assembly person, or one of their staff members. And at your local level, it's contacting your town supervisor or mayor about securing funding for your program in the town's budgets. This goes the same for your county level. Um, I know recently that the federal government released some community block grants that were given out to the, to the town levels. So if you were to contact your uh, supervisor or mayor um, and ask for that funding or kind of get a direction of that funding, that would count as the public policy direct lobbying part. So this is, there is some federal guidelines to this. Um, it cannot make an, it has to be an insubstantial amount of the activities that you do. Um, here at Feedmore, this is my full-time job is doing government affairs work and this does not take up a substantial amount of my time so it will not take up a substantial amount of your time but it's always good to kind of track what you are doing that is what i do i have an excel sheet and every time i ask for something from an elected official no matter what level i'll write that down so i know that this happened um it it's going to take up it it can be up to 20 percent of the first five hundred thousand dollars your organization makes um we are not at this level at feedmore i don't expect you guys to be at this level um, and if you do get this level, you and I should have a conversation separately um, and we'll talk about that a little more. And grassroots lobbying and mobilization. So this means just um, trying to present the public to share your views on a particular legislative proposal and to act on it. Um, so this is reaching out um, to your clients, to your volunteers, any kind of social media base. If you have a listserv um, to send an email out to all of them, to let them know to reach out to their member of Congress to vote yes or no on a particular bill, uh, calling your local officials to ask for funding as well. These kind of run the same gamuts as the as direct lobbying uh, that cannot take up, up, up a substantial amount of your time. Um, once again, this does not. Um, I do a lot of education and then I'll do a lot of call to actions, we call them, um, where I'll send stuff out to the agencies or our general public to see if they can reach out to their elected officials. This is a little bit of a quiz time. Um, so if you have the answer, what gender are you moderating? Great. So if you have, if you know what this is, please write it in the chat. So you schedule a site visit with your county executive to educate her about your programs. Oh, she's a woman. Nice. And show the impact your agency is having on the community. What would you call this, everyone? Would it be a direct lobbying? Would it be uh, grassroots mobilization? Or would it be, um, obviously, I'm forgetting the third one. Um, any, any takers? No one? I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go. This is not lobbying. So you are able to do this as much as you want because you were just educating them. Next up. So you send a letter to your US Senator asking him or her to support a bill when it comes, comes to a vote next week. Um, is this gonna be grassroots? Is it direct lobbying or is it just educational? 
Jen, do you have an idea? <laughs> it is direct lobbying. This is much better in person, everybody, I promise. Um, so you send an action alert to the public urging them to increase their to call the representatives and vote to support in a proposed increase in funding for senior feeding programs. Um, this would be grassroots lobbying. Is your, oh well. Um, <laughs> so this is you're gonna send out to the public, the general public asking them to take action. This is gonna be your grassroots level, um, your boots on the ground type of type of lobbying. No more quiz, that's it. Um, next up, I'm just going to run through a quick government snapshot of, of what it looks like. This is going to be on your federal and state levels. Um, I did not go down to your local levels because that would just be tedious and we would be here all day if I went through towns, every town. So this is just a quick overview. Um, for your state government assembly, there's about 150 assembly members, um, 102 Democrats, 43 Republicans, and there's one independent. Um, our majority leader is Crystal People Stoke. She's in Buffalo, New York. So that is great for us. If you are in her district, she is um, very willing to, to lend a hand, very willing to reach out. So if you are in the city of Buffalo and you would like any assistance, her office is wonderful and always willing to help. Um, the minority leader is William Bark, um, Barclay. He is in Fulton, New York, which is near Syracuse. Um, since 1975, the New York State Assembly has been under the democratic control. These are just the committees. Um, I'm not going to read through these, but it is important for you to know where your assembly people lie. So what committees are on, if they are on agriculture, if they are on health, if they are on um, anything with, that would, veterans affairs, um, social services, anything that kind of circles back to what you do, it's helpful to know that and helpful to know who has that power. Uh, state government for your Senate. So there's 63 senators, uh, 40 Democratic members, 20 Republican, and three vacant. We do have a couple of vacant spots here um, in Fieber, Western New York service area. Um, and then the majority leader is Andrew Stewart Cousins, who is in Westchester County. And then a minority leader is Rob Ort, who is in Niagara County, another local person who has some power and someone to reach out to. Um, also not listed here, but uh, Tim Kennedy is in is in Buffalo, New York, and he has a lot of power in the, in the New York State Senate. Um, and he is a big fan of the work that you all do and a big fan of helping individuals. So his office is also a great resource for you. Uh, in 2018, the New York State Senate was taken over by the Democratic Party for the first time in 50 years. This is the first time in a while that we've had um, a Democratic Assembly, Senate, and a governor as well. Once again, these are the committees. I will not read through them, but just make sure you know where your senator lies um, and the power that they have. Your federal government. We have 435 voting members and six non-voting members. Um, you can read 232 Democrats, 197 Republicans. Um, Speaker of the House is Nancy Pelosi. Uh, you'll recognize some of these names. I'm not gonna run through them all for you, but it's just helpful to know who is in charge and who is the power person here. Um, I'm gonna talk about this a little later, but just so you know, um, this November 3rd, election day, every single House representative in the United States is up for re-election. So all 435 of those seats are up for re-election. These are the committees that they stand on. Um, just remember, once again, where they stand. Agriculture is a big one here. Oops, I'll go back. Um, appropriations, they decide where the money goes. So you always want to have a fan in appropriations. Uh, the federal Senate, U.S. Senate, we have 100 members, 53 Republican, 43 Democrat, and two independents. Um, Mike Pence is the president of the Senate. Mitch McConnell, Chuck Schumer, once again, New York State. Um, his office is also very, um, responsive to us and anything we need. So if you guys are in need of assistance or need anything else from them, they are always very helpful. Committees as well, agriculture um, and nutrition and forestry, I would say is our biggest one in the US Senate. They handle the farm bill, which handles SNAP money, as well as your TFAP funding that we get a lot of the, the USDA food from. So who represents me and my organization? Uh, 
it's very important for you to know your representatives. 78% um, of legislative assistants and directors say that constituents frequently do not know the committee assignments. As I mentioned this before, it's very important that you, if you meet with them, to know where they are, what they're doing, and then what their committees that they're on. Here are just, um, I believe this will be sent to you guys, this slide deck. I'll send it to you guys, and I also have some attachments too, but these are just hyperlinks that will kind of let you know, figure out who is in your assembly, um, your house, or your New York State Senator, if you do not know those already. And then know your local government. Check out their websites of their towns or cities to get your local government information. Um, your board, the supervisors, mayors, and treasurers are always good people to have in your back pocket. Always good people to know. Um, and this is also very helpful for me. Um, create a legislative profile. This can be done at any level, state, federal, uh, local, whatever. I'm gonna give you an example and it's gonna be at a federal level, but you can do this for your mayor. It's sure it's someone that you've known your whole life. Um, so just fill it out. This is what it should include, your personal information, their hometown, marital status, children, and then their contact information so you know who to reach. As I mentioned, this is on the federal, like state level, so I have the DC Albany, and that may not be applicable for who you're making this for, but this is always a very helpful thing to have. This is an example of what one looks like. So I did uh, US Senator Kirsten Gillibrand with, um, with Amy Poehler as uh, Leslie Nope when she was on Parks and Rec. It's probably one of my favorite photos. Um, but just to run through, she's a Democrat, who her husband is, who her two kids are, how she became a senator, and what committee she is on, you'll see below. Um, I will give a quick example of how this really helped me. So I did this before I went to uh, DC a couple years ago, and I did one for, for the US representative, Tom Reed. Tom Reed has a son who has diabetes. So when I went in for my presentation, we gave him our newsletter, which focused on a story of a gentleman named Randy from the Olean Food Pantry who also had diabetes and was attending our Just Say Yes to Fruits and Vegetables programming at Olean and learned how to use a crock pot, learned how to cook these vegetables and actually had his diabetes under control for the first time in his life. So I was able to pull this from my legislative profile for Tom and connect it directly to a story that I had right in front of him. And it's able to make that human connection. Um, you have to remember that these these representatives are also humans. They have a life outside of what they do here. So it's always nice to to bring it kind of home for them. Importance of the staff. So this is um, mostly on your federal and state level, but it, um, but it resonates no matter where. Um, so your chief of staff, your admin, you wanna reach out to the legislative director. The good people to have in your pocket are, um, are the people who do the scheduling. So the schedulers or the appointment makers are always nice to have their, um, their emails right away. And if you get to the point of reaching out to their chief of staff or their legislative director, to always kind of have them on hand and always thinking of you first. And I will say, um, if you go to DC or Albany, you'll notice year after year after year, people will start off as their interns and they'll work their way up to being their scheduler or their chief of staff. Um, so it's always good to, to, to have a smile and talk to whomever, whether or not you agree personally with their policies. How can you get them involved? This is the big one. Um, you have to engage with your, your elected officials. Um, you have to let them know what you're doing. So you can do in-person meetings, whether that's at their offices or their, um, or yeah, at their offices, or if you meet somewhere for coffee. Um, I know things are a little different now with, with COVID going on. Um, so you may be a little weary of in-person meetings. A lot of them are doing Zoom meetings. Um, a lot of them are taking phone calls. So there's ways to meet with them, whether or not you go directly to their office. And site visits. Coming to your location, seeing what you do, seeing the work that you are doing firsthand is the strongest thing that you could do for this. Press conferences, if you're having one at your location, if you say you moved or you're adding on an addition or you have a new truck or whatever, whatever it may be, invite them, invite them all. They may not show up, but you know what? You invited them, you reached out, now you're on their mind in district events. Um, if you wanna peek around your area and see what is happening and see 
you know, what's going on and attend them. If they're hosting a town hall, stop at their town hall, ask a question, make yourself known, introduce yourself. It's all about making sure that you are who they think of when they think of hunger relief in their area. Email staff, very simple. Um, most email addresses are found online, or if you need help finding one, um, you can reach out to me and I can kind of connect you with who I have. Uh, but emailing them is, is, is the easiest communication form. Uh, phone calls as well, and social media. They all have social media, whether it's Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, they're all on one platform or another. Make sure you're following them. Make sure you are tweeting at them. Um, nice, nice things. Um, <laughs> Make sure you're tweeting at them, make sure you're tagging them in things. Um, it's always helpful to be known. In-person meetings, so these are once again a little on the federal level, but you can apply them to working um, at, this, at your local level as well. So you wanna visit your rep, um, you wanna reach out to them about three or four weeks in advance of the meeting and let them know what you are meeting for. Um, I, that's a good, rule of thumb for no matter who you're meeting with, uh, develop, develop your elevator pitch. So you may not have um, a half an hour to sit down and tell them about your program or your needs of your program or the people you serve. So you wanna develop a quick two minute elevator, elevator pitch of, this is who I am, this is what we do, this is what we need from you. Um, send a staffer an email the night before with any attachments that you may be presenting them that day. So they have it so they can prepare before your meeting. And then after the meeting, make sure you uh, thank them and follow up with any materials you had promised. So if, you, if they ask you a question and you do not know the answer, which has happened to me numerous, numerous times, you are able to follow up them the next day and say, thank you so much for your time. Here's the information you asked. Here's the answer to the questions. You never want to leave a meeting with these questions on the table and not follow up. So tips for meeting with your elected officials, be clear on the goal. You're going in there for a reason. Make sure you know what it is and know who you're talking to. So that means their, um, their party, which party they're a part of, um, which committees that they're on, what are they really passionate about? You can find all of this stuff so easily online. Um, it's all right there for you. There's a lot of uh, websites who have kind of compiled everything so you have that, but you just don't wanna go in there and be, thinking that you're talking to someone else and just kind of, and just speak about something that does not matter to them. Know your issue. Um, this is another huge one. You wanna go in there and you wanna know why you're there and back it up with some facts. You know, back it up with some stories of the individuals you serve. Connect your issue to the members, district or state. Local and localize whatever you're saying. Talk about a client, talk about, you know, the the town that is struggling and what SNAP does for your town and how it helps make it better. Keep it short, as I mentioned before, you will not have a lot of time with them. I've had meetings where I've been in the hallway between like a water fountain and a bathroom, and I've had about five seconds to get out my point of why I was there. So you wanna be sure that you're prepared to keep it very short. As I said, deliver your message in the first five minutes. And don't make any negative remarks about other members or elected officials or any type of politician. You don't know who is friends with who. As I previously mentioned, they are, they're people, so they have friends. Um, I think a good example of this now is Ruth Bader Ginsburg was very good friends with Anthony Scalia, and they had such very different ideas of, they were in different metrics, but they were very good friends. So you don't want to sit there and criticize one to the other when they're going to go back and say, hey, did you know that Lauren from Feedmore actually thinks that you're a terrible person? You don't want to do that. So you want to keep it very neutral um, and, and keep it on message. And make sure you leave a leave behind packet. So we'll go into that in a little bit or right now. So they're very happy to accept the leave, leave behind packet. This is a norm. Um, this is something that people mostly do. This packet should include a one pager on your organization and the bill you are supporting if you are there to support a bill. If you're not, that's fine. Um, facts about your area and that are pertinent to your mission and organization. Um, district data, so any kind of food and security rates, um, SNAP participations in your area, uh, the number of people you serve per month. You have that information. You do your monthly reports for us every month. So you have that, you have who you're serving any kind of recent articles about your organization 
or recent articles about the program that you are working with um, and your business cards and contact information. Um, if you go to the state or federal level, they'll ask for your business cards before you, basically you take one step in and they'll ask for your business cards So make sure you have that ready for them. And less is more. Um, we, I struggle with this because I want to give them all of my information. I want to give them every newsletter we've had, every piece of information I have, but they don't want that. They want quick and concise. When you email them your thank you and your follow-up, you can attach whatever you want. So you can attach 7,000 articles. You can do whatever you want at that point, but when you're handing them a physical leave behind, make sure that less is more. Site visits. As I mentioned, these are the best things you could do. So invite them to your site, show them the work that you do. Um, it's the most impactful way you could engage with them. Um, they will see firsthand the individuals you are, you are serving and they'll talk to you, your volunteers, and maybe clients. Um, this photo is representative of Tom Reed. I'm using him a lot today. Um, he stopped by the Olean Food Pantry. Um, I think this was right before the Farm Bill was released. He came in and he was given a tour of the food pantry, their garden, and then we were there with uh, the Food Bank of Southern Tier and then Food Link from Rochester, New York. They all came in and we had a little convening uh, meeting with him to talk about the impacts of SNAP. So here are just some quick examples of the advocacy work that Feed More West New York is doing. Advocating for SNAP, I think, is my biggest one. Um, it is always seems to be always on the chopping block. It's something that we're always fighting for. Um, so we have joined with Feeding America and Meals on Wheels um, to fight for um, protection and expansion of the program. Um, these are these are a couple old examples of social media stuff that we do, but I do post on our social media um, whenever we have something, a call to action like this or um, SNAP is under attack. As I mentioned, this is the biggest thing that I really kind of advocate for. This and the Older Americans Act, which funds um, our home delivered meal program as well as the congregate dining sites. And then advocating for SNAP still, as I mentioned. So we did a op-ed, this was this past year. Um, we did it with Foodlink in Rochester and Southern Tier Food Bank in Elmira. The op-ed was for the expansion of SNAP. Um, once again, we did it with these three people because we had called out our house representative, Tom Reed. He, the three food banks there are, cover his whole district. So we all got together, we all wrote this op-ed and we put it in our papers um, throughout. Um, he has always kind of been a proponent against SNAP and always kind of in the vehicle of cutting SNAP. So we targeted this whole direct um, address right to him. And he actually had came out after this and then uh, a couple of times since and said that he is for increasing SNAP. So, you know, you keep pushing, you push, you push, and hopefully you get something that is worthwhile. Um, and this, this op-ed also spurred a couple more uh, news articles. So. Um, the Buffalo News reached out to us again about a different piece. So, you know, as long as you are talking, people will be listening. And media with elected officials. So, um, you know, we're in DC, we're in, I go to DC uh, once, a, once or twice a year in Albany in the same amount of time to talk with our elected officials. I focus a lot of my attention on the federal and state levels. Um, locally, I'm working now more to get very in, into their offices talk about the work that you guys are doing directly in their communities. So in the future, I probably will be calling on a lot of you to say if you want to come into a meeting with your town mayor or your town board or reach out to you for those connections as well. So how to get involved. So here are two current Feed More Western campaigns that we're running. Get out to vote. As I mentioned, November 3rd is election day. Tomorrow, 10-9, is the last day to register to vote in New York State. Um, here we have posters, we have lawn signs, we have stickers to encourage people to vote. Um, we even have vote water bottles for you to order. They're currently on your shopping list, so if you would like those. Um, this is a big thing for us. So as a 501c3, we are a nonpartisan organization. So all of you are nonpartisan organizations. You cannot take a side. You cannot campaign for, a, for an elected official. But what you can do is encourage people to vote, which is what we are doing. So um, if you would like anything um, at your agency, please reach out to me and I will get you whatever you need. 
um, I'll put it on your order or I'll mail it to you or I will drive it to you. But we will, we are, the people we serve are the people who need to vote. They're the people who, who changes are being made on behalf of them. They need their voice and voting is a way for us to encourage that. So um, that is a big campaign for us. So we are working on it for the rest of this month. And the census. So October 31st is the last day to fill out your census. Um, the census numbers allow the federal government to allocate resources to us based on our population. We are undercounted. We have been undercounted for, I mean, at least the last 10 years. So we really encourage you to encourage your clients to fill this out. I have posters I can, I can send out to you, the same as to get out to vote. Um, we are pushing for people to make sure they take their census. If you haven't taken your census and you're on here right now, please log off and take it. Um, so we have your numbers counted. Um, they have been reaching out to some age, I'll talk about this because I know it was an issue. So the census has been reaching out to agencies to get numbers of people served. Um, they will not be, they should not be requesting any type of client information from you. Um, they may ask for the how many people you serve in a month. They may ask um, the zip codes you serve. They may ask the languages that you serve, um, but they will not ask you for any particular client information. So, and it's up to you if you wanna give that. If you do not, you're under no federal guidelines um, through the United States or under any guidelines from us to give that up. It is whatever you are comfortable with. We have also had census takers come to mobile pantries or come to food distributions to, to fill out the census um, as well. Um, everything was followed by COVID guidelines, so everyone wore masks, there was social distancing involved, but those were ways that you can currently get involved. And connect and stay informed. So social media, follow us, make sure you follow us um, at FeedMoreWNY on all platforms. We're on social media, Twitter, and Facebook. And follow your elected officials. As I mentioned before, they all have social media. That's how they're connecting with people. That's how they're uh, responding to individuals. That's how they're letting people know what's going on. Make sure you're following them. Make sure you're seeing what they're doing. Sign up for advocacy emails. Um, I do send out action alerts and I do send out um, just kind of updates on what is going on periodically. Uh, we send it to, I send it to all of the constant contact list of agency coordinators. So if you're getting those emails, you will be getting mine. But if you have a different email address that you would like it to go to, please reach out to me and I can add you to that. Google Alerts, this is one of my favorite ones. So I have Google Alerts set up for all of our elected officials um, at the federal and state levels. So anytime that they're in the news, anytime they're mentioned in an article, I get an email that compiles all of that for me. So I'll spend like one day and I'll sit through and read and see if there's anything applicable to us or if they're releasing a bill that I think that we should, co uh, we should champion, or I think that it's not good for us, I'll get all of that through Google Alerts. And call your local representatives, invite them down. As I mentioned before, seeing firsthand what you do, talking to the in individuals you serve, talking to you who's on the front lines, who's been on the front lines, um, is the greatest way to make any type of impact. And then contact me. This is my name, my email address, and my direct phone number. Um, and and I will be. I would love to help you in any way possible. And that's all I got, guys. Any questions? I'm gonna exit. All right, everyone. Well, that was it. Um, I will send out um, this PowerPoint presentation for anyone who registered, as well as a couple different um, active uh, ideas and papers that I've put together that helped me. Um, if you have any questions at all, please feel free to reach out to me. Thank Thanks, you very Lauren. Much. Thank you, Thanks, Lauren. Lauren. It was great.